Melul is the god of poetry and song. He and his faith look to foster a love for performance across the realms to further inspire people. I'm Ben Dignan, and welcome once again to Religion in the Realms. Titles Malu goes by the following titles Lord of Song, The One True Hand of All Wise Ogma, The Lord of All Songs, Guardian of Singers and Troubadours, and The One Who Watches While Music is Alive. Malu has one known alias among the lesser known aquatic Shalaran Rai Dea Mela or Rai Dea Mila. There isn't an exact pronunciation given, so I'm just going with that. I'd like to just get this out of the way before going further into the episode. Traditionally, Malil's followers and clergy are known as Sorlin. This stands in contrast to other deities we have followed who usually have a term derived from their name. Say, for example, Selenites or Sharans. Fourth edition's Forgotten Rounds campaign guide calls out that the adjective Malilians may be used, but is the only source book to reference this term. In setting, it is believed that the term Sorlin is derived from the name of one of the initial founders of Malil's faith, whose identity has been lost to time. Portfolio and Domains Malil holds the portfolios of poetry, song, and eloquence. His suggested domain for 5th edition is light, but I also believe you could include knowledge. Appearance and manifestations. Melil is commonly depicted as a beautiful and charismatic human bard. In these depictions, his age varies. Sometimes he may be portrayed as an elf or half elf in the same garb. We will touch on Melil's various alliances and his inclusion in the elven pantheon in a bit. But it is enough to say here that he is considered a member of the elven pantheon. Half-elven depictions of Malil are found mostly in regions with a large half-elven population, like Aglarond. He commonly is dressed in bright colors in a troubadour's dress. Such clothing features fancy patterns with gold or bejeweled decorative elements and accoutrements. Most often, he is depicted with shoulder-length brown or blonde hair and is clean-shaven. It is easy to pick out images of Malil given the silver five-stringed harp made of leaves he always seems to have on his person. This harp being the inspiration for his holy symbol, no doubt. Malil's favored weapon is the rapier. He wields his own magical rapier, which he calls Sharp Tongue. According to 2nd edition's Faiths and Avatars, Sharp Tongue is a plus-three rapier that also holds the qualities of a sword of quickness and a sword of dancing. Melil may land out his rapier to someone of his faith who is about to undertake an important quest in his name. While Sharp Tongue holds both the qualities of a sword of dancing and sword of quickness in the hands of a mortal follower, they can only use one of these qualities per round. Melil has four known manifestations. The first is a haunting melody. A singing male voice emanates from some unknown source. Usually, such a manifestation is heard deep in some forest clearing. The second is a visible radiance that surrounds an entertainer lost in inspiration. The third manifestation is a dancing pair of holly fonts made of conjured glowing yellow lines that flit about in the air, or they are drawn with ink upon a piece of parchment, despite any lack of ink. This manifestation is used by Malil to show his approval. It is speculated that Malil is fond of watching holly fonts dance to music. The fourth and final manifestation is visions granted to performers that Malil is pleased by. Such visions are meant to assist such individuals in finding treasure and or direct lost or unsure individuals. Malil makes use of the following creatures to communicate his approval, disapproval, or aid his mortal followers. Asamar who are masterful singers, holly fonts, Light Asamon, Lantern Archons, Movonic Devas, Solars, Songbirds, usually Nightingales, White Horses or Pegasi, and Calico Cats. 
Peregrine falcons are another creature he is fond of having appear before his followers to show his favor and inspire followers. Malil can manifest items of the prime material to reward his mortal followers. These include red or yellow lilies, peonies, and well-cut gemstones of any variety. Abilities Through 1st edition and early into 2nd edition, Malil was listed as a demi-power. Later on in 2nd edition through 3rd edition, Malil came to be known as a lesser god. Why he was raised from a demi-power to a lesser power, I don't know. I found no explicit reason given. But a similar advancement in power level occurred with Denir. I think the same reason would be stated for both gods. Then into 4th edition, Malil was listed as an exarch, though still in service to Ogma. The campaign guide from 4th edition calls out expressly that exarchs are commonly known as demigods as well. Why 4th edition did not decide to just stick with the terms from the previous edition, I do not know. Though it does read like exarch is a broader term to encompass some lesser powers, demigods, and quasi-divine beings. Why Malil dropped down once again in rank, I could not find a reason. Malil is among the vast majority of deities with no stated divine rank in 5th edition. Despite this, I feel comfortable saying that he is likely a lesser deity in 5th edition's deific hierarchy. Malil may provide guidance to his faithful with a quick means of egress out of a situation or a needed magical item in a certain situation. We don't have any hard statistics for Malil as a deity. He is one of many who did not receive a full stat block in the Faerunian Pantheon for 3rd edition. However, we do have access to the abilities and statistics of his avatar from 2nd edition's Faiths and Avatars. Just be aware that I will be utilizing 2nd edition mechanical terms at times in discussing the avatar's features. His avatar has access to any priest sphere or wizard school, though shows a deep preference for spells that charm or those that have a vocal or musical quality to them. Any such vocal or musical spells Malil's avatar casts are at triple their normal effectiveness, and those who must save against these spells receive a negative 3 penalty. The avatar can conjure forth any weapon and is proficient with any of these weapons, though the avatar prefers Sharp Tongue, Malil's very own magical rapier. The avatar can easily protect itself from mundane weapon attacks and turn most spells back towards those who cast them. Just by singing, Malil's avatar can break any silence effects and or cause creatures within 90 feet of them to stop fighting immediately. This effect lasts so long as Malil keeps singing. Malil is fond of showing his avatar to be divine by conjuring forth a harp made of flames to play upon. Malil's avatar has a variety of powerful abilities that it can imbue with a touch. The avatar may impart all details of a song and lyrics to an entertainer. This he does primarily to hint at knowledge of some treasure or instructions for his followers in the years to come. The avatar may also grant a being the ability to play a single instrument with the proficiency of a master. The avatar then may also cure deafness or cause deafness in a creature. The deafness inflicted on the being is granted no saving throw and can only be cured by another divine power. Not surprising anyone, Malil's avatar plays any instrument with utter mastery and majesty, even those instruments that exist outside of the Forgotten Realms themselves. Any song heard by Sorlin, Malil himself can play with perfect recall. As he sings, he can manifest other voices or the sounds of other instruments to accompany him. Malil's avatar is immune to all spell and spell effects that have musical, vocal, sound, or instrumental elements. Personal History Frankly, there is very little to be said about Malil's history in the realms. There are hints to suggest that he hasn't always been a god since the creation of Toril, but nothing substantial enough to guess at an era or year to his apotheosis. During the Time of Troubles in 1358 Dale Reckoning, Malil in his avatar form made his way to the city of Athkatla. Here Malil formed a new singing circle and took the initial steps in creating a new temple in his name called the Arbalist's House. The Patriarch of Song, who we will talk about later on, was asked by Malil directly to oversee the remainder of the construction. Past that, Malil has survived without any real issue past the spell plague and into the present day. Personality Malil is a neutral good god. 
As a patron of performers, he's brimming with confidence and creativity. While he can easily improvise an oration or tune, he is a master of the theory and skill behind all performing arts. Malou has a wide repertoire of knowledge to draw upon from all fields just as any great bard does. These positive attributes aside, Malil is a vain and attention-seeking individual. He dislikes not being the center of attention and will quickly move on or daydream if he feels he's being ignored. He is rather flirtatious both with mortals and deities alike, much to the frustration of other less amorous deific allies. Personal Realms In the Great Wheel cosmological model used in 1st edition, 2nd edition, and is the assumed default model for 5th edition Forgotten Realms, Malil resides on the split neutral good, chaotic good outer plane of the Beastlands. The Beastlands also goes by the titles of the Happy Hunting Grounds and the Three-Tiered Wilderness. Here he resides on the second layer of the Beastlands known as Brux. His shared divine realm is known as the Library of All Knowledge. He shares this realm with Denir. Just be aware that what I'm about to cover for the Beastlands and the Library of All Knowledge is exactly the same as I stated in the Denier episode, so by all means skip ahead a couple minutes to when I talk about the Great Tree. The Beastlands, as the name suggests, is a plain of untamed wilderness dominated by animals and other creatures alike. Between all the upper plains and the Great Wheel, the Beastlands lacks the most in any settlements or structures. At most, a camp might be found in one's travels. The souls that depart the prime material to come and reside here manifest as animals, though in the form of these animals they retain their former intelligence and capability to speak. Visitors to the Beastlands also tend to manifest the physical trait of a given animal after spending time on this wild plain. Though much of the other animals living here are just normal animals and beasts as one would expect on the prime material. There's a multitude of different biomes represented in the Beastlands as well, though every biome is thriving in both flora and fauna. The plain is lit by two celestial bodies, Solera, the plain's sun, and Noctos, the plain's moon. Travel between the three layers is fairly easy, with a multitude of portals between each of them. The problem is that since the portals are so numerous, a person might run in between two trees and unknowingly wind up on another layer of the Beastlands altogether. And most of these portals are only one way. At this point it needs to be said that in 3rd edition's Manual of the Plains, the description of the Beastlands is much the same, though there was one chief difference. One being that mortal souls who come to reside here do not turn into animals. Rather they maintain their humanoid form, but come to develop animalistic traits, much like a shifter from Eberron, or a lesser lycanthrope. Brux, the second layer of the Beastlands, is sometimes referred to as the land of never-ending twilight. Solera, the sun, and Noctos, the moon, both hang in the sky along the horizon, unmoving on Brux. This shades all of Brux in perpetual dim light. The plants turn their flowers and leaves to face the sun. The temperatures are cool and humid as fog and mist is a common natural occurrence on Brux. A wide swath of biomes are represented and the animals that are most active at dawn or dusk flourish. The dim light allows long, dark shadows to be cast throughout this lair. Some of these shadows are said to hold hidden treasures or passageways to other realms, though the local creatures know all too well to use these shadows to better hunt prey. I was able to find the briefest of descriptions of Malil's realm. The library of all knowledge contains within it all that is known and true. Malil and Denir both send some of their more powerful servitors to travel to Ogma's realm in the Outlands. It is thought that there is a permanent portal between both Ogma's realm and the Library of All Knowledge in the Beastlands. The Beastlands is admittedly an odd home plane for Malil, though I can imagine just out in the depths of some forest or swamp in Brux is this exquisite and large library that stands out in stark contrast against the nature all around it. But I don't think the Library of All Knowledge is in direct conflict with the nature around it. Rather, the two have embraced one another as the library structure is covered by vines and flowers of all sorts. The resident animals are able to fly, crawl, and run about the premises without being harried by the petitioners of Malil and Denier. 
though the animals know well enough to keep the archives and books well alone. In the World Tree cosmological model used for 3rd edition Forgotten Realms, Malil resides on the plane of the House of Knowledge. This plane is presided over by Malil's superior, Agma. The house is really several buildings here or there across the plain. The rest of the plain is dominated by a forest of old oak trees and pools of clear water. Constellations dot the night sky, and continuous harp music echoes throughout the plain spanning forest. Denier, Malil, and Gon do not have their own realms here. Instead, they frequent and favor other buildings that likely contain material and subjects of a great interest to them. On this plane, knowledge both orally and written is valued highly and preserved. The petitioners that reside in the House of Knowledge look much like they did in their mortal lives. Within the 4th edition World Axis cosmological model, Malil resides in Ogma's domain, known as the House of Knowledge, out in the Astral Sea. Frankly, its description is more or less the same as that of the description of the House of Knowledge in the World Tree though the Library of All Knowledge is called out here as a series of buildings found on the domain that hold any desired piece of knowledge, secret or not. Allies and Allegiances As a member of the deities of knowledge and invention, Agma is Malil's superior. Malil is regarded as Agma's left hand and Anir Agma's right. Both dutifully serve Agma, providing him with all sorts of new knowledge. One of Malil's titles calls him out as the one true hand of Agma. This isn't meant to be derisive a denier. Rather, it is to highlight the connection of left-handedness re- with creativity. Creativity, which Agma holds in high regard. While the nature of the relationship between denier and Malil is never overtly stated, I imagine it to be respectful and amicable. After all, they share a divine realm with one another in the Great Wheel though I do not think Malil and Denier spend much of their free time together, given their disparate personalities. Gion and Malil are also allied given their shared superior in Agma, though this alliance is one purely out of duty. Gion and Malil believe that they share little to nothing in common and do not see eye to eye. Malil has a strong relationship with Lyra, goddess of joy and dance. Malil and Lyra are found working together often. He is also allies with Mistra, Suni, Lathander, Charesse, and Finder Wivenspur, who Ed Greenwood has confirmed has returned as a deity, though is excluded out of the Faerunian pantheon in Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. I have a tweet down in the episode description if you wish to see Greenwood's thoughts on this. Malil is considered a member of the Elven pantheon as well though he does not go by another name or aspect, say like Mailiki does. The chief reason for his inclusion is said to be the grace and allure of his song. Within the Seldarine, he is allies with Corallon Larethian, patron deity of the elves, Ongarath, the triune goddess of the moon elves, Erevan Ilysir, elven god of mischief and elven rogues, Hanali Silanil, elven goddess of love and beauty, Labellus Enereth, elven god of time and history, and Sianine Moonbow, elven goddess of mysticism and dreams. Perhaps there is a discrepancy, but 2nd edition's face and avatars list Rilafane Relithil, elven god of woodlands and nature, as an ally of Malil's. But then, demi-human deities, from the same edition, does not list out Malil as one of Rilafane's allies. Much like all good aligned deities in the Faeronian pantheon, the halfling goddess Cyrilli of hearth and friendship is also an ally of Malil's. Still Song, a mysterious deity of song, who is not part of any particular pantheon, is another of Malil's deific allies. Enemies Malil has one stated foe. After mocking Cyric's madness in a ballad, the Prince of Lies has a strong dislike for the Lord of Song. Symbols. In the Faerunian pantheon, Malil's faith has one known symbol with some variation. The most well-known variation is a five-stringed harp. This harp is usually made out of silver leaves. While many Sorlin are harpers, the shared symbol of the harp between both is a coincidence. Beneath the waters of the Sea of Fallen Stars, 
The little symbol is still that of a harp, but the harp's body is formed out of a silver curved dolphin or whale. Central Dogma from 3rd Edition's Face and Pantheons Quote, Life is a song beginning at birth and only silence with the final chord. Strive always to make the whole song, not just the lyrics and music, more beautiful. Destroy no music or instrument, nor stop a singer before the tune is done. Listen to the world around as well as filling it with your own sound. One singer's music is another's noise, so still no bad music if it's making be joyful. Spread the teaching of song and musicianship always. Sing to Malil every day. Music is the most precious thing folk can create, so encourage its training, use, and preservation at all times and in all possible ways. Awaken a love of song in all folk you can and offer its performance freely around campfire or on the trail. Cease not in your own seeking for new tunes, new techniques, and new instruments to master. End quote. Presence of the Faith Malil's clerics tend to hold an alignment of chaotic good, lawful good, or neutral good. The bulk of them are human, half-elven, or elven. Given his portfolios, Malil is a favorite deity among adventurers, bards, and a variety of entertainers. Quick prayers may be said in Malil's name before a speech, performance, or undertaking some other creative endeavor. The faith of Malil is primarily made up of sensualists, prizing the finer things in life, the beautiful aspects of nature, and engaging in the company of others frequently. Regionally, Malil's faith is found mostly in the north of Faerun. Malil and the Sorlin are direct supporters of the Harpers, and many Sorlin are Harpers themselves. Malil has a presence beneath the waters of Faerun. Dolphins can, with some divine aid and training, become Sorlin themselves. Though it should be said that this phenomenon is, is not just limited to Malil's faith. A couple of different faiths include dolphins among their clergy. There are some whales who are also Malil adherents. These whales are fond of performing for the Sorlin. Among the lesser known Shalaran people, Malil also has some adherents. As I mentioned earlier in their dialect, they refer to Malil as Rai Dea Maila. Hierarchy and Structure of the Clergy as I mentioned earlier, all clergy of Malil are known as Sorlin. Why this term is used instead of a term like Malilians is thought to be a forgotten piece of knowledge. Though some speculate that Sorlin was derived or taken directly from the name of a long ago patriarch. The ratio of men to women in the clergy is about equal. Two thirds are human, a quarter of the remaining third are elves, and half elves make up the difference. According to second edition's faiths and avatars, 50% of Malil's faith are clerics, the bulk of the other half is made of specific Sorlin specialty priests known as tune servants, and there is a smattering of bards, mystics, and spell singers. Mind you, this information is definitely informed by character options that were only present in second edition at the time. Going forward in the third edition, such a breakdown is never mentioned again given 3rd edition lacked most of these character options. The Sorlin used the following ranks for the clergy in ascending order. Mute One, who is a novice of the faith. Chanter, the first rank of the full clergy. Chorister. Soloist. Lead Voice. First Song. Song Master. And finally, Glorian. Individual titles may be given out to clergy members depending on their role within a place of worship. Such titles include Castellan, Master Tutor, Master Wind, Master Serenader, Master Librarian, Master Instrumentalist, Prior, and Patriarch. Individually, each Sorlin addresses one another by the title of Harmonian, despite which rank they might hold. Even still, Sorlin are pretty laid back about such formalities. The only Sorlin they truly address at all times with the proper title is the Patriarch of Song. The Sorlin faith is presided over by the Patriarch of Song. The Patriarch is an older human man of indeterminate age and origin. 
Such details have been lost to the sands of time. He has a kind face, white beard, and light blue eyes. Despite his aged hands, he is the most acclaimed harpist not just in Faerun, but all of Toril. Likely through divine power, he can make sounds come from a harp that it otherwise should not be capable of. The Patriarch has had all sorts of various guises across the years. If need be, the Patriarch can ask Malil to change his gender in order to fulfill one of these guises. He is fond of showing up in some taverns as an older minstrel and leaving the audience there in tears and awe. This he does with the sole intent of inspiring younger bards and minstrels abroad. Through a powerful and enchanting song, the Patriarch can easily enthrall those who come to hear it. They are placed in a stupor, fixating on the music. Only the roughest sort of actions against the affected will be enough to break them from the trance. Sorlin hold that Malil has granted the Patriarch these various abilities and immortality to boot. Though it goes unstated, I do wonder if the Patriarch should be considered a chosen of Malil. It is said among the faithful that so long as the Patriarch lives, music will continue to grow and flourish. The Patriarch formerly operated out of Waterdeep, but moved to Athkatla and Alm. This he did after Malil asked him to oversee the construction of the Arbalist House, a new Sorlan Temple. Whether the Patriarch is still primarily based out of Athkatla in present-day Faerun, I do not know. Every Sorlan place of worship acknowledges the authority of the Patriarch, even if it is just done in lip service. Adherence to the Patriarch's wishes and commands tends to wane the further you get from the Patriarch's center of power and influence. These distant Sorlan tend to adhere to the calls and orders of utmost importance. Responsibilities and Duties of the Faithful Sorlan need to be trained vocalists and have proficiency with one musical instrument. Apart from those required proficiencies, many are trained composers and dancers. Sorlin offer their services as instrument makers, tutors, and teachers for free to those who hold Malil as their patron deity, or for a fee for those simply wanting to learn. Though they may ask nothing of the poor and working class, save maybe a meal and a drink. Sorlin may be asked to judge competitions for the musical arts. They may also serve as intermediaries in disputes between bards. Such disputes may be as simple as that between two bards or as large as a conflict between two rival bardic colleges. Throughout their days, Sorlin work on expanding their repertoire of songs and instrument proficiency, both in places of worship or whilst traveling. They make an effort to write down both the songs they learn from others and those they come to compose themselves. This is to preserve knowledge of such music for generations to come and so that music is not lost. Some do this through a specific Sorlin spell known as Singing Stone. In short, the spell allows for the caster to record a piece of song played and or sung. The duration of the recording can only be three breaths long. So often, more than one stone needs to have the spell cast upon it to capture an entire song. In turn, recordings on these stones can be hidden away or archived in temple vaults. Sorlin who prefer the road are well known for assisting bards and minstrels alike should they find themselves in a tough situation. They may also adventure into different sites to discover forgotten songs and or magical instruments, or find a group of like-minded companions to adventure with. Adventures serve as material for future ballads and tunes in later days as Sorlin reflect upon their experiences. While it isn't mandated, there is an expectation that each Sorlin donate coin to the respective temple at least once every year. Some use this donation as a means of personal competition, trying to outdonate their other Sorlin at the temple. Orders and Priestly Bodies The Sorlin faith has one known knightly order called the Harmonious Order. This affable, though sometimes cocksure, order is made up of devoted paladins, fighters, and bards if you go by 2nd edition, or it is made up of about 100 paladins and clerics if you refer to 3rd edition sources. One of their chief responsibilities is guarding and defending Sorlin places of worship. Another responsibility is performing quests and good deeds in Malil's name. 
They like to have bards in their adventuring parties so their exploits can be put to song. Lore singers are Sorlin, with a talent for telling stories through song. They believe their role in inspiring common folk through song and story is of the utmost importance, not just religiously, but for the good of all society. Mechanically, they have the various skills available to them that bards do, save spellcasting. In exchange, they are unable to turn undead. Likewise, they can find themselves subject to fear effects if their voice is ever stifled, say through spells or mundane means. Appearance and Dress Sorlin ceremonial dress is made of rich and bold fabric, typically emblazoned with the patterns of dragons, bards, and or warriors whirling about. Small wind chimes double as anklets, earrings, and other accoutrements worn on the person though they will remove such items when it comes time for a performance. Hair may be cut short or bound in a golden hairnet so as not to interfere with musical instruments. They may hold an actual harp as their holy symbol, or wear the harp of Malo as a piece of jewelry upon their person. When adventuring, Sorlin prefer armor with a degree of ornamentation. They often wield maces and magical instruments. While they perform, Lower singers garb themselves in white shirts with puffy sleeves and green or tan tights. On their back, they wear a crimson cape patterned with golden dragons. When adventuring, lower singers favor leather armor, though armor that matches the flamboyant clothes they wear. Lower singers equip themselves usually with a rapier and the parrying dagger. Rituals Clerics and Sorlin clergy pray and meditate on their spells when they wake at dawn. They perform a specific song at this time. Third edition's Fates and Pantheons calls this song the Song of Praise, while second edition's Fates and Avatars calls it the Sunrise Song. The Sunrise Song is described as a soft chant. Despite what name is used, the song is sung in Malil's name. In both second edition and third edition sources, though, it is said that the Song of Praise is also performed after every victory or great success. Sorlin, found in the depths of the Sea of Fallen Stars, based out of the city of Myth Nantar, accompany whales on a pilgrimage. This pilgrimage is made in memoriam to a being known as Nahal, the great whale bard who was killed in 1369 Dale Reckoning in the Twelfth Saros War. Second edition's Sea of Fallen Stars sourcebook does not mention if Nahal was a Sorlin or not. Either way, the Sorlin wished to show deep respect for the bard responsible for leading all whale song beneath the inner sea for so long. The Song of Sorrowing is sung to mourn the death of one of Malil's faithful. The Song of Welcoming is sung when someone new is brought into the faith. The Call of Flowers is sung on green grass. The festival day between the months of Tarsac and Myrtle on the calendar of Harptos. While no other details are provided, the call of flowers is probably a song of religious importance tied to the coming of spring. The Grand Revel is held on Midsummer, the festival day between Flame Rule and Elysis on the calendar of Harptos. As the name suggests, the Grand Revel is a large feast and dance where parodies and satirical songs are performed for all. Any ritual performed by a group of Sorlin follows a certain order. First, the opening call is sung or played. Second, each member performs an individual piece while kneeling before an altar. Third, a unified hymn is sung together, followed by a sermon or offering to Malil. Finally, a closing song is performed by all. This closing song always rises to a large crescendo. General Characteristics of Places of Worship Sorlin places of worship are found in centers of music. They may vary from the largest concert hall to a small choral chamber, but one commonality must exist between them all. Excellent acoustics. Sorlin temples are typically grandiose in architecture. Each has a choir loft, classes for music instruction, workshops for creating and fixing instruments, musical libraries, and theaters for performances of different varieties. Sorlin temples do not contain many of what are considered traditional holy tomes. 
Rather, books full of composition, lyrics, poetry, and ballads are readily available. Melil never puts too much stock in the idea of such holy tomes, though we will touch on one near the end of the episode. Rather, enchanted musical instruments are prized above tomes. Specific Places of Worship The Scholar's Priory in Calimport is a complex made of three temples devoted to Ogma, Melil, and Denier. This complex is found in the Hook Ward. All three temples share a central courtyard. All three clergies pitch in when it comes time to fill the central cistern shared by all. Several create water spells are cast to fill the cistern in the morning. Candle Keep is held to be a place of worship to the Sorlin and other knowledge-based faiths. The clergy of Malil are one of a select group of people who do not have to make a donation of a new tome or work to Candle Keep to receive admittance. Instead, Sorlin are admitted for free. However, they will often bring a donation anyways. A shrine to Malil can be found in Candle Keep. It is found in a demi planar chamber attached to the hearth, Candle Keep's own tavern. The next location is taken from a second edition source, so I do not know what state it may presently exist in in the Forgotten Realms. In the adventurous quarter of Waterdeep can be found the Temple of Good Cheer. This temple is dedicated both to Lyra and Melil. The temple is really just the upper floor of a three-storied row house that has had its rooms converted to house the temple proper, a dance classroom, and a music class. You can identify the temple out on the street by the plaque displaying Lyra and Melil's respective symbols out of the third-story window. This temple is run by a married couple, the wife a clergy member of Lyra, and the husband a clergy member of Melil's. The Arbalist House can be found in Athcatla. Melil himself laid the groundwork for this temple when he found himself down on Toril during the Time of Troubles. He left the remainder of its supervision to the Patriarch of Song. Now the Patriarch of Song was initially based out of Waterdeep, where he was deeply involved in building up the Sorlin faith. However, Melil created a gate for the Patriarch between the Arbalist House and the Bardic College of New Alam in Waterdeep. Here in this temple can be found the organ called the Bellows of Melil, which can be heard out across the harbour of Athkatla. The multi-spired Evensong Tower can be found in Burdusk. The temple has a handful of tall, slender towers made of stone. Each tower is linked to one another by a series of flying bridges. Strong poles at the top of each of the towers display banners of a wide array of attractive colours. Evensong Tower is known for its revels attended by the wealthy and elite, both based in Burdusk and abroad. Though admittance may be granted to those who can impress the local clergy at the gates or bluff their way in. About two of these revels are held every ten day. While the revel is a time for dance, feasting, and music, it also serves as a time for social lights to make jests towards one another in good humor without reprisal. The main room of the temple holds the revel proper, but side rooms are signed for the public oration of poems and speeches. These typically are more of an interest to scholars and academics. The Theatre of Joy in Cremor is a shared temple for followers of Malil, Sunni, and Lyra. Once a former amphitheater from the days of the Shun Empire, the clergy here have converted it into an informal temple. Reliquaries for each of the three faiths can be found in behind the amphitheater in the actor's outbuilding. Sunni is worshipped from dawn until noon. Sorlin put on performances from noon to dusk, and the joybringers of Lyra use the theater all throughout the night. Shared services are sometimes held for each of the three deities, and a large party is held on the temple grounds. The Halls of Inspiration is a shared temple in Silvery Moon dedicated to Ogma and Malil. It is a large rectangular shaped temple with four tall towers. The towers house libraries, study rooms, and prayer chambers. Each tower holds silver bells that are sounded at the start of every religious service. The temple proper is constructed in the form of a three story amphitheater, and the chapel has balconies for choirs and audiences. Here, traveling bards and worshippers can easily find room and board. 
The dancing place is a pilgrimage site not just for Sorlin, but for a host of deities who appeared when the Harpers were founded in this glade in the High Dale. Named temples to Melil include House of Song in Selgaunt, the Happy House of Splendor and Song in Tantris, which is also a base of operations for the local Harpers, Descanter in Myth Nantar, beneath the waters of the Sea of Fallen Stars, and finally, Sorlin Abbey of High Song, northwest of Nashgul. Unnamed shrines to Melil can be found in Suzale and Arabel. Character Options For 2nd edition, the Toon Servant Specialty Priest can be found in Faiths and Avatars. The Lore Singer Priest variant can be found in Warriors and Priests of the Realms. For 3rd edition, the Initiate of Melil Feet can be found in Champions of Valor. Not necessarily directly tied to the Sorlin Faith, but there is a prestige class known as the Spell Dancer in Magic of Faerun. This is a favorite prestige class among Sorlin clerics. Here is just a breakdown of the features that I think someone deeply involved in Melil's faith as an acolyte or otherwise would have for a custom background in 5th edition. For your two skill proficiencies, there's performance in one of either history or religion. For your language or tool proficiencies, elven in one musical instrument of your choice. For your equipment, the entertainers from the player's handbook, though using some of that starting gold to start off with a holy symbol of Melil. Finally, for the ribbon feature attached to the background, there's always the Acolyte Shelter of the Faithful in the player's handbook, or the entertainers by popular demand which is also in the player's handbook. Next is a list of subclasses that I think would be thematically appropriate for a NPC or PC to have if they are a worshipper of Malil. For the Bard, obviously there's going to be a lot. There's the College of Lore or Valor from the player's handbook, the College of Glamour or Swords from Xanathar's Guide to Everything, the College of Creation from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, a College of Eloquence, which is also in Tasha's, but can be found as well in Mythic Odysseys of Theros, and the College of Spirits from Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. Did consider the College of Whispers, but it seems a little too nefarious for Melil's faith. For the Cleric, there's the Light or Knowledge Domain in the Player's Handbook. For the Fighter, there's the Champion in the Player's Handbook. For the Paladin, there's the Oath of Glory found in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, or Mythic Odysseys of Theros. For the Rogue, there's the Swashbuckler from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. For the Warlock, there's the Celestial Patron in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. And finally, for the Wizard, I kind of bandied this one about, but considering that Melil is tied to the Elven Pantheon, there's the Blade Singing Wizard from Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Dungeon Master Options To start, here's just a list of 5th edition creatures and monsters that are tied to the Sorlin Faith that are found in official 5th edition source books. From the Monster Manual, there's the Solar, the Deva, the Pegasus, the Cat, and the various different variety of horses. From Waterdeep Dragon Heist, there is the Falcon. And finally, from Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus, there's the stat block for the Holly Font. Following this, I just want to touch on some creatures that have, as of yet, not been introduced to 5th edition sources that are tied to Melil's faith. Light Asimon are celestial amorphous creatures seemingly made of multi-hued radiant light. When looking upon a light Asimon, a good aligned person is said to be able to see a reflection of their finest moment of their life. They can serve as familiars for high level good aligned spellcasters. There is a unique ritual that may be attempted to call upon the aid of a light Asimon. They are thought to be the embodiment of good in a physical form. The second edition stat block can be found in Monstrous Compendium Planescape Appendix and Monstrous Compendium Outer Planes Appendix. Mavonic Devas are one of three subsets of Devas described in earlier editions of D&D. Some sources will describe them as strictly male. Their skin is white like snow, with silver eyes and hair. Though they may be lawful, neutral, or chaotic good in alignment. Movonic devas are most active on the primaterial plane. 
Most tend to carry magical, slender greatswords with an enchantment on them that functions much like a flame tongue weapon. Unsurprisingly, they wield all sorts of helpful and protective divine magics. They are able to pass into the material plane at will. And when they arrive, they usually shape change into the form of an animal or humanoid to go by undetected. Mavonic Devas can be found in 1st edition's Monster Manual 2, 2nd edition's Monstrous Compendium Planescape Appendix, and 3rd edition's Fiend Folio. Lantern Archons are the lowest member of the Celestial Archons who are native to Mount Celestia. In general, Archons are the protectors of the Lawful Good Plane and all goodly peoples. As their name suggests, a Lantern Archon is a floating ball of light. They offer their assistance willingly to those who come to visit Mount Celestia. As a simple incorporeal creature, they rely upon their light rays to attack opponents. Stat blocks for Lantern Archons can be found in 1st edition's Manual of the Planes, 2nd edition's Planescape Supplement, Planes of Law, and 3.5e's Monster Manual. To round out the section on stat blocks, the following are just a list of humanoid NPC stat blocks to represent various below worshippers and clergy. Keep in mind with spellcasters, you can always swap out their listed spells for those that are more fitting. From the Monster Manual, there's the Acolyte and Priest. From Volo's Guide to Monsters, there's the Bard, Swashbuckler, and the Enchanter. All of these are also found in the newly released Mordenkainen Presents Monster of the Multiverse. Now to touch on some specific Sorlin magic items. The Withindal Brown Book is a rare holy tome in the Sorlin faith. The book is named after the half-elven bard Melil delivered this very book to about 500 plus years ago. Withindal was a blind half-elven bard who made it to the summit of one of the Cloven Mountains. There he sung Melil's praises, and thus Melil gifted the bard with this holy tome. The tome's circular covers are made of unbreakable black stone. Upon each cover are inlaid horizontal and vertical bars of different lengths overlapping one another. No one has been able to discern any significance to this unique latticework. The circular vellum pages are wire-rimmed. The tome is enchanted in such a way that despite its round shape, it will not roll away or be knocked over on accident or by the elements, so long as it is stood up, though an intentional grab by a person can set it down. Upon opening the book, snippets of music can be heard. The tunes which are picked are random with no discernible order. Any magic user can make use of the spells present in the round book without ill effect, save three. Any non sorlin attempting to cast these three spells, which are said to be gifted from Malil himself, places a gesh upon the user. The command placed upon them is to help the first Sorlin clergy member who requests their help. What's more, higher level Sorlin are able to sense when this gesh has been placed upon someone. The round book has the innate ability to teleport at will without error to anywhere throughout Faerun. No magical or physical binds as of yet have been able to deny this ability. It is thought that by imbuing this book with its property, Melil ensured that the round book and thus his faith would be spread across the continent. The last known location of the round book was in the possession of a Sorlin priest who had retired to a villa northwest of Nashkel, until one night he was murdered in 1358 Dale Reckoning, and the round book was no doubt taken away by his murderers. The full details of the Withindal round book can be found in 2nd edition's Prayers from the Faithful. A Joyous Star Song is a magical scroll made of stamped silver. The first of these magic scrolls were made in tandem by the face of Lyra and Molil. Each scroll bears the symbols of both deities. The scroll holds the lyrics and notes to an inspiring song. A bard who performs this song is granted an additional use of their bardic music feature with a bonus to perform check. This magic item can be found in 3rd edition's Magic of Faerun. The Rod of Tuning is a favorite magic item used by Sorlin clerics among others. One of its basic features is the rod's ability to sound any musical note desired by the wielder by striking the rod against a hard surface. The first of its more powerful abilities 
is potentially banishing extraplanar creatures. By striking the rod, extraplanar creatures within 30 feet of the wheeler have to save or be banished. This can be done once per day. The second and final of its powerful abilities is access to the Holy Word spell. This spell affects any evil creature within 30 feet of the wielder. This ability can also be used once per day. This magic item can also be found in 3rd edition's Magic of Faerun. And let's round up the DM section of the podcast by touching on some official 5th edition magic items that I think would be thematically appropriate for Malil's faith to have access to or be in possession of. From the DMG, the Dancing Sword, Glamoured Studded Leather, the Various Instruments of the Bards, Pipes of Haunting, Pipes of the Sewers, Potion of Heroism, Staff of Charming, and the Tome of Leadership and Influence. From Mythic Odysseys of Theros, the Siren Song Lyre. From Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, the Plus One to Plus Three Rhythm Maker's Drum, and the Lyre of Building. From Strixhaven Curriculum of Chaos, a reflavored Prismari Primer. And finally, from Xanathar's Guide to Everything, Cloak of Billowing, Cloak of Many Fashions, Instrument of Illusions, and Instrument of Scribing. All right, thank you for listening to Religion in the Realms. If you're interested in keeping up with the release of future episodes, you can follow the podcast Twitter account at Realms Religion. These episodes are uploaded to YouTube as well. Audio versions of the podcast can be found on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts. If you wish to get in touch with me with any questions or just want to chat, my personal Twitter is at Shivs Embrace, or you can send an email to realmsreligion at gmail.com. In the next episode, I will be finishing up the Deities of Knowledge and Invention by covering Gond, the neutral god of craft and artifice. Until next time, may Timor look kindly upon your dice rolls, Helm protect you, and Lathander light your path. Music for this episode. Sir Troll Moonshine by Ian Grimm of tubersongs.com.